This video will cover part of the standard level section of C3.1 on system integration and where we're going to take a close look at hormone integration. A great example of how hormones are used to communicate and integrate several body systems is melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that is produced by the pineal gland in our brain. It's a tiny gland that produces a really important hormone. And this melatonin controls the circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are just that pattern of sleep and wake cycles that organisms are adapted for. It could be at different times of the day, but melatonin is inhibited by light. So the way that this works is that we have a light receptor in our eye and that light receptor, when it senses light, sends a message to the central nervous system, inhibiting the production of melatonin at that pineal gland. When that light is no longer present, so for us that might be at nighttime or when we're in a dark room, okay, then that melatonin production is no longer inhibited. The pineal gland will make the melatonin and because it is a hormone, it will travel through the blood to various parts of our body. Different target tissues with the receptor for that melatonin hormone will pick up on that and we'll see a variety of effects. So that could include a drop in our body temperature, drowsiness, and sleep. Epinephrine is another example of a hormone that helps to integrate several body systems. Now, some people may refer to epinephrine as adrenaline, and it's called adrenaline because it is secreted by the adrenal glands that sit on top of our kidneys. You can use either word, epinephrine or adrenaline. I do recommend though that you learn to recognize this hormone just by the name epinephrine. It's used a little bit more consistently um, and widely, so maybe just keep that in mind. This is a hormone, again, it's traveling from the adrenal glands all throughout the body through our bloodstream that is there to prepare for vigorous activity. So this is what we call our fight or flight hormone. If you need to do something vigorously, either running from a danger or fighting, then you're going to need two things to be widely delivered to like your skeletal muscles and other parts of your body. You're gonna need glucose for energy and you're gonna need oxygen so that you can use this glucose in the aerobic cell respiration pathway to create the ATP that those skeletal muscles are going to need. So when we talk about hormones integrating several body systems, check out this wide array of examples of different effects of this hormone epinephrine. It can cause the hydrolysis of glycogen. Glycogen is a polysaccharide made of many glucoses hooked together. So when that glycogen is hydrolyzed, it's cut up into glucoses and that can then enter the bloodstream. Good, check, we need that. It can help increase the diameter of the bronchi and bronchioles. So these are tubes in our lungs that help deliver air if you haven't studied gas exchange yet. So if I increase the diameter, that's going to help deliver more oxygen to the blood. And the same will happen to the ventilation rate. So ventilation rate is how often we're breathing. Tidal volume is the volume of lung or of air that we're getting into our lungs. So those are both going to to increase to supply more oxygen. The SA node, we'll talk more about the SA node, but this is the pacemaker of our heart. So this will increase heart rate. Why is that important? Well, because we gotta get these things delivered via our blood to our skeletal muscles. And we're also going to go through a series of vasoconstriction, that's lessening blood flow, and vasodilation, that's increasing blood flow, uh, very purposely to different parts of the body. So we want to decrease the blood flow to the gut and to the kidneys. The gut and the kidneys are important for digestion and filtering of things, but we don't need that in this moment of fight or flight. What we do need is more blood supply um, going to our muscles and our liver. So we want to increase the blood flow there. The muscles, that's obvious. They are the ones that need to move, they need these things. The liver, 
is where a lot of our glycogen is stored. So if we're cutting up that glycogen into glucose, we wanna send the blood to the liver, it then picks up that glucose and then can carry it to the muscles. But again, all of this happens because of this hormone epinephrine and it's happening and communicating with different body systems because it is traveling through our bloodstream. So we know that our nervous system and our hormone secreting glands are both very important for integrating our body systems, but how do they talk to each other? Well, that's the role of this very small yet very important section of our brain called our hypothalamus and our pituitary gland. They are teeny tiny and they're right in the middle of their brain, but they are a really important connection between the nervous system and the endocrine system. So the hypothalamus has like a stalk that looks like this and the pituitary has two lobes, an anterior one and a posterior one, but they're both sitting right there. And the hypothalamus is going to receive input from a lot of different sources. So it has information coming in from other parts of the brain. It it also has information coming in from different sensors around the body, like sensors for temperature or glucose levels or solute concentration. And it takes all of that input from nervous signaling and it causes an output of hormonal signaling. Okay, so all of these are examples of ways that it is getting input from nerves, okay? But what comes out of the hypothalamus and pituitary pituitary are hormones. So this is quite literally the connection between those two very, very important communication methods in our organ systems. Now let's take a look at a couple of examples. First, we'll look at something called osmoregulation. I love this. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is regulating the osmolarity or solute concentration of our blood. So the hypothalamus is going to receive information from sensory organs about the solute concentration of our blood. Okay, so it's getting this sensory information that is coming in and it's interpreting that information. If the um, solute concentration is too high and the body needs to conserve water, this hypothalamus is then going to prompt that pituitary gland to secrete a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Okay, so that's the hormone part of this whole step. All right, that hormone then is going to cause a reabsorption of water in the kidney. All right, so that is the effector part here, and that is the link between the nervous system and the hormone. In addition to being the link between nervous input and hormone production, the hypothalamus can also interpret hormonal information. So during puberty, some of the changes in our bodies causes our hypothalamus to release a hormone called GNRH. That stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. And that hormone travels to the pituitary, causing the pituitary to produce hormones like luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. The names of those hormones, you'll get well acquainted with those in another topic. The names and functions of the hormones right now aren't as important as understanding that this hypothalamus and pituitary, they provide the bridge between sensory input, either from um, motor or nervous impulses or from other hormonal uh, bits of information to that hormone producing system. So this can take nervous or hormonal messages, interpret them, and then cause a cascade of hormone production to affect certain changes in our bodies. The control of our heartbeat is also another really cool example of the interaction between chemical signals and nervous signals. So before we get into that, let's just look at the connection between our brain and our heart. Obviously this picture isn't drawn in the correct orientation, but I want you to be able to see some of these details. In our heart, we have something called the SA node. It's located right up here in the right atrium, and SA stands for senoatrial node. You will also hear some people refer to this node as the pacemaker of the heart, and that's because the SA node controls the heartbeat. 
it is connected to a very small but very important part of our brain right down here in the brainstem called the medulla oblongata. And there are two nerves that connect the SA node with the medulla oblongata. So one of them, and again, this isn't drawn to scale, but one of them here is called the vagus nerve. And the other one is called the sympathetic nerve. So they both go in the same direction, okay? They both travel from the brain to the SA node. They both can only transmit directions or nervous impulses towards the SA node. So why would I need two different nerves traveling in the same direction to the same place? Well, because they're going to cause different effects. The vagus nerve is going to cause the SA node to slow down the heart rate, and the sympathetic nerve is going to cause an increase in the heart rate. And so we'll see how that works with the chemical components uh, in our blood. First, let's talk about these chemoreceptors. So kind of like dangling down from your medulla oblongata into your carotid arteries here, you have some chemoreceptors and they are receptors for different chemical levels. And in this particular case, they're sensing pH. So the pH of our blood needs to stay about 7.3 to 7.4, and that is our body's way of making sure that we don't have really high levels of carbon dioxide in our blood plasma. You see, when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, like in our blood plasma, it causes the pH to drop. So I know that if my chemoreceptors are sensing a low pH, that means I have too much carbon dioxide in that blood. I need to pump that blood to the lungs and be able to get rid of that carbon dioxide via ventilation. So when the pH is low, then the medulla oblongata will send a message along that sympathetic nerve to increase the heart rate. It will tell the SA node to increase the heart rate. When that pH returns back to normal, then it will send a message along that vagus nerve to slow that heart rate back down. So it's in a feedback loop with the chemoreceptors. It's also in a feedback loop with baroreceptors. Baro is a prefix that means pressure, like a barometer measures pressure. And extending, we don't see this in this picture, but extending out of the heart is a big blood vessel called the aorta. And that aorta delivers oxygenated blood from your heart to the rest of your body. Now, those baroreceptors are going to sense when the pressure in the aorta is above or below what it should be. So if the blood pressure is too low, okay, then some changes are going to occur that tells the SA node to increase that heart rate. So to push more, to squeeze more, okay, to get that blood flowing through that aorta. Um, and it's important to note that although both of these affect heart rate, okay, and these are more nervous signaling, epinephrine, that hormone that we've talked about before, can override both of these. So it's possible that the heart may be getting multiple messages at the same time. It may be getting nervous messages, okay, from that extend from these receptors, but also hormonal messages as well. So you can see here how the integration of different body systems um, is highly involved with the types of communication methods between those systems and organs.